someday we're going to leave this world. God is not like that. He doesn't die. But He's an infinite God in that sense. He's also unlimited in other senses. He's all wise. He's not just sometimes He's wise. Most of the time, He's wise. He's wise. That means sometimes He's not wise. He's not like that. He's all wise. Okay? All powerful. All loving. And He revealed Himself in two ways. By natural revelation and supernatural revelation. Natural revelation means in nature. You see the moon, the star, the hills, the ocean. You can reason in your mind that someone brought these things into existence. You can see God in nature. Although you can admit that a God exists, you still don't know who that God is. You still don't know what He wants you to do. You don't know His message, His will, and so on, right? That takes special revelation. All right, the special revelation would mean that He revealed Himself to us through His Word, the Bible, the Scriptures. That's supernatural revelation. And there is also the history of the Israelite nation, the Jewish people, out of one man, Abraham. God called through this man came a nation of Jewish people. Through that nation of Jewish people comes a man called Jesus Christ. When he died on the cross, he was buried, he resurrected, he purchased the church with his own blood. He established the church and today anyone who believes in the gospel and embrace the gospel, God adds him to the church. And Jesus Christ is the incarnation of God, meaning that he has always existed as God from the very beginning. But at a point in the history of mankind, 2,000 years ago, the second person of the Godhead came in the form of a man, was born through a virgin, lived as a man, died, buried, resurrected, ascended to be on God's right hand. That's the incarnation of Jesus. This is a summary of the Christian religion, the Christian faith, all right? This is our fundamental thesis. And sometimes people look at this Christian religion and they say it is a leap of faith. It is a leap of faith where it is, it is a, a, a religion based on faith. But why is faith so, so impossible? Why is faith so uh, very difficult to, to accept? Let's look at something that we do every day. These are the things that we do every day. We don't question it. Do you not do these things by faith? You dine in a restaurant, right? Nice restaurant. You go eat there because you like the food there. Did you know that you are taking a risk also? How did you know that the ceiling will not collapse and kill you? How did you know, know that the food that you ate was contaminated by bacteria and you are going to be in hospital after eating it? You have no, no qualms about it. You believe that it will not hurt you. You went there by faith. You ate, you enjoyed, you left, and you did not think that you would be affected by it, isn't it? That's a leap of faith as well. Driving along the highway. How do you know you will not meet an accident? Someone carelessly will knock into you. You drove by faith. Riding in an airplane. Uh, Sister Chin, we find an eye flew here, firefly. We pray that we have a safe journey. We landed, we took off safely, we landed safely. Uh, we took the risk also. There is a risk involved, a measure of risk, but we accept it. So everything that we do in life, we accept it by faith. That is a leap of faith. You read the newspaper, it tells you something about an event that happened half the world away. How can you trust it? What if it's false? But you never question it, isn't it? You accept it by faith if it's true. And buying a house, how do you know that the house is uh, good for you, that it is strong, it will continue to be strong, and that its structure will not fail you? All of this is a leap of faith, isn't it? Religion is not the only thing that requires faith. Most common day, everyday transaction requires faith as well. So the proof takes place in the mind as far as the Christian apologetic is concerned. And the proof is accepted only when the mind is open and the mind is honored. Many people saw the miracles of Christ during his days, but yet would not believe in his deity. They saw the miracle, they ate of the fruit that he had multiplied, and some would still not accept that he is deity, he is divine. Christian apologetic is effective only when the mind is open and honest. 
What is Christian apologetic? We discussed it last night. It is the effort by Christians to provide reasons for the Christian faith. So if a person is honest and he is rational, he's open, he will be able to find that it is a reasonable, reasonable religion. Some people claim to be free thinkers. But actually, there are very few free thinkers in the world. Most people mean when they say they are free thinkers, it means that they are not practicing anything. They don't have any altar in the house. They are not going to church. They actually are not practicing anything by religion. But in the mind, they already, they already have some preconceived idea. And so a person sometimes declares himself to be a free thinker. So in a conversation with him, you offered him uh, some possibilities about a God, about him revealing his Bible, the scriptures to mankind, that's the inspired word of God, and uh, he doesn't agree. He said, no, I don't think so. That means he's not really a free thinker. What is a free thinker? A free thinker is a person who says, I have no religion. I don't believe in anything in particular, but I'm open to it. In other words, you can tell me what you believe, and I will listen, and I will make up my mind whether I believe it. So a free thinker is a person who should be open and honest, but most people are not. Okay. We had talked about the causes of unbelief earlier at 5 o'clock this evening. These are some of the reasons why people would not believe. And today, when we talk about the evidence, is there a God or not? These are the things that we should consider. We look at the weight of the evidence. Is the evidence clear? Is the person presenting to you honest? All right? Or is the person who is listening to this presentation of evidence, is it logical? And does he have any prejudice? If he would remove any prejudices that he has, if he's able to reason sensibly, if he has no reason to doubt the person presenting these facts to him, if the evidences are clear and the evidences can hold his own, then he can accept it. If he's honest and open, the existence of God. We're not looking at the evidences yet until tomorrow, but in the fields of logic, we must consider certain things. Like for example, this is the field of logic. All cats have four legs, okay? Tom is a cat, therefore Tom has four legs. We can all accept it, isn't it? Right? It's logical, we can all accept it. This is called good logic. But there is also something that's called bad logic. For example, all cats have four legs. All tables have four legs. Therefore, all tables are cats. <laughs> this is bad logic. This is bad logic. Why do we point this out? We point this out because in Christian apologetics, in the defense of the Christian faith, when a person talks to another person who is not a believer and presents this fact, there are some people in the world who are not logical in their reasoning. They just cannot reason. And they will tell you something like that. All tables are cats. Because the table is falling, cats are falling, so all tables are cats. So how do you reason with a person like that? So then it will not work. Christian apologetics will not work. He already has uh, some preconceived ideas because of his bad logic, and therefore it's not going to work in him. All right. So when we're saying that just because you are able to present certain logical reasoning to people, it's not a guarantee that people will accept what you say. It depends on their mind. They're thinking. The law of excluded middle, everything that is precisely stated, right, are either true or false. Uh, if the statement or a proposition, if it is precisely stated, is either true or is false. It cannot both be true and false at the same time. All cats have four legs. All cats do not have four legs. Only one of them is true. Or both of them can be false. All right? And uh, this is what is meant by that. So an object cannot both possess and not possess a certain characteristic. So we're saying all this to say that either God exists or He does not exist. And that's all. There are no other possibilities. And so we're going to present the, the evidences. And in the end, you are only left with a choice to accept that He exists or to reject the fact, uh, the possibility that He exists. The Lord excluded middle, God exists, precisely, it's a precisely stated proposition. It's a proposal that a God may exist. Okay? It's uh, precise, it's either true or false, there is no middle ground, 
and ages. His mind said it, God does not exist. A theist, God exists. We are theists. We believe in a personal God. An agnostic, he says, I'm not sure whether God exists or not. I don't know. I'm not sure. Agnostic, all right? And the skeptics say, I'm doubtful that God exists. And only one of the above statement is true. They cannot all be true. It cannot be that a God exists. A God also does not exist. We don't know whether a God exists. Uh, we're not sure. So all of this uh, possibilities, but yet only one is true. So that means if God exists, then atheists are wrong. The agnostics are wrong. The skeptics are wrong. And that's what we're trying to tell you, all right? The evidence of God existence is found in this uh, scripture that we have read earlier. In the invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen, okay? God has created the world, left in nature. Today we look at them, it shows the invisible attributes of God. What are they? Being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The invisible things of God are His almightiness. You cannot see that almighty power of God, but you can see the result of His power, the world, the creation of the world, and His Godhead, His divinity. You cannot see His divinity, but you can see the works that He has done. So these are the invisible attributes of God. And so men, by looking at what is in nature, have no excuse. A man cannot see these things in nature and then conclude, I don't think God exists. So the God holds him responsible. God holds him responsible by one day, he's going to stand before God in judgment. He cannot say to God, when I was alive on earth for 85 years, I never thought that a God exists. I didn't see any signs that a God exists. God said, there are a lot of signs that shows you that I exist. You have no excuse to offer. And that is what is meant by this uh, scripture. The theist says that evidence proves that God exists. We cannot demonstrate God scientifically. All right? He cannot be examined in a test tube. Why? You cannot examine uh, a, a certain uh, matter in powder form in a test tube, pour some chemicals into it, see the reaction, and then be able to conclude positively, absolutely, there is the presence of iron in this compound because of this reaction. Confirm. God is not like that. Why so? A fire needs oxygen to burn. All right? Fire is hot, ice is cold. All of this proof cater to our five senses. We have all five senses. Sight, vision, hearing, touch, taste, and uh, how many? Four? One more. What's that? Smelling. Smelling. Okay. So these are called empirical proof, meaning that it caters to the five senses. They are derived from experiments and observation catering to our five senses. We can either hear it, we can either feel it, we can smell it, and then we say, yes, it's true. God is not like that. Why? God is a spirit. God is a spiritual being. We are human beings. We are physical. God is not physical. We cannot see Him. We cannot touch Him. We cannot feel Him. We cannot smell Him. We cannot hear Him in that sense. All right? And therefore, God cannot be demonstrated scientifically. A person says, a person does not believe in God. He says, show me God in front of me and I will believe Him. That doesn't make sense. Why? Because he has failed to understand that God is not a physical being. God is a spiritual being. Are there things in life that we cannot see and yet we accept it? Yes. The wind, isn't it? The wind. You see the trees blowing, swirling. You cannot see the wind. You can see the effects of the wind. You stand outside the window, you can feel the wind blowing in your face. Yet you cannot see the wind. There are things that we cannot see in life, yet we accept that it exists. Can anyone see air? Can anyone smell air? Can anyone touch air? Can anyone hear air? You can't. But nobody in the right mind will say, I don't believe there's air around here in this room. 
Can I see your mind? Can I smell your mind? Can I touch your mind? Can I hear your mind? I can't, right? Therefore, is it right for me to conclude you do not have a mind? <laughs>